Okay, what I would like to talk about uh, in this lecture is uh, the complexity in language and how to analyze complexity using statistical tools. In particular, we will be looking at measures of correlation. We will be looking at clusters and factors as part of multidimensional analysis. I'd like to start with pictures, metaphors, or stories. So here's a story uh, to start with. Uh, when you communicate with a publisher, you usually have some options for the cover of your, of your book. Um, this was the option that I eventually have chosen uh, when I was, I was thinking what would be sort of the best metaphorical representation uh, uh, for statistics in corpus linguistics. And I think, and just, just to you know, give you a bit, bit of an insight into, into that, so this is the picture that appeared on, uh, on the cover. I thought what we are really looking uh, for in this pursuit of statistics in corpus linguistics is really uncover complexities. And we know that the complexities uh, of language are multiple on so many different levels. And what we can hope for is to zoom in, focus on a complexity at a time, and move on and sort of try to make sense of what is going on. So that's why some of these uh, points are blurred in the distance. Right? You can get there, and this is you know, part of the scientific pursuit as well, scientific pursuit of language. Uh, we focus on one area, try to explore it, also communicate with other researchers to see whether they would be able to uh, bring something interesting uh, into the picture, and then we sort of try to understand that uh, as part of the complexity. There's a bit of humility uh, as part of this scientific pursuit as well, because we know that we'll never reach the complexity of the truth about language or any, any subject that we are uh, uh, exploring. It's like the sort of stars in the sky. There are far too many. Uh, but um, I think it's worth just pursuing it because there's some kind of magic attraction if we do do this. So before we start looking at the specific measures and the specific statistical tools, again, I would like to start uh, with a question. Uh, think about how language works. Uh, is it more surprising to find that some linguistic features are related or that they are unrelated? Think about this question, turn to the people sitting around you, and just take a minute or two to discuss it. Right? A bit of a philosophical question uh, in the morning. I ask this question uh, quite on purpose because uh, what you'll see actually is that we shouldn't be surprised to find that there are relationships between things in language. It's actually much harder to find something that is not related in language, right? Uh, as sort of a zero correlation, almost non-existent in, 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 in language. Because obviously, words have to live uh, and share the same space of language and discourse, right? So there will be patterns. The question is, which patterns are of interest in a particular area of analysis, and how can we actually uh, identify them using statistical techniques? Well, where to start the question that we uh, always, always start with? Uh, well, probably when we look at relationships in corpora and when we look at real data. The first example is a relationship between nouns and adjectives in language. And again, you can see the data cloud with individual texts there. Uh, this is based on uh, a current corpus uh, of uh, written British English, VO6. So there are 500 of these different texts. And you can see a clear pattern here with the line of the best fit or a so-called regression line. What you can see is that the slope goes up. So we would say that uh, uh, there's some kind of positive relationship. Uh, there is uh, these two variables are positively correlated, right? And we'll see how we can actually measure that specifically in a moment. When you look at another graph that shows another clear pattern of a sort of slightly different kind, we have verbs and adjectives, right? In this case, uh, the 
uh, plus sign would be turned into a minus sign because they are negatively correlated. Right? The more verbs I have, the fewer adjectives I have, and vice versa in the text. Again, uh, with all the empirical evidence based on uh, a one million word corpus of current British English. As I said, I spent quite a long, <laughs> long, long time uh, to find a relationship that would be sort of all over the place, where uh, the line would be straight and there wouldn't be a clear correlation pattern, because uh, most of the word classes in language are correlated in some way. Because, uh, well, think of adjectives and the nouns, right? Uh, a noun, uh, an adjective presupposes that there is a noun that the, the adjective talks about and the same thing goes with uh, other word classes. Pronouns and uh, coordinators, so coordinating constructions, uh, don't seem to be related because they, they work at very different levels. One is sort of syntactic level and one is sort of the, the, the level of morphology. So th they don't have a specific type of relationship in written language. So what you'll see is uh, no relationship with the data cloud being all over the place, sort of scattered about. Right? So you can already start with a scatter plot to see whether there is any relationship in the data between two variables that you might be interested in, two linguistic variables in particular. Well, how would we be able to measure this? Because this is sort of the first starting point. We visualize the relationship and perhaps they'll draw a regression line. But we would be able to measure that through covariance and correlation. And these two terms are connected because covariance feeds into co correlation. So let me explain uh, this term first. Covariance is in a way similar to standard deviation, whereas standard deviation is a measure of variation with a single variable, one linguistic variable. When we have two linguistic variables, such as nouns and adjectives, we want to be looking at variation in terms of their mutual relationship, measure of covariance of these uh, variables, how they vary together, right? So if you have two variables, you are looking at covariance. Uh, covariance, and if you are interested in the details, uh, is calculated as the sum of multiplied distances from mean one and mean two, uh, and then divided by the total of cases minus one. Right? Bit of statistical wizardry there, but it's actually not too too complex, not too complicated, and it, it makes sense from our sort of common sense perspective. So let us have a look at some examples. This has been taken as a sort of small subsample from the corpus. Here we have nouns on the x-axis and adjectives on the y-axis, and again, I have just a few, few cases, so I can sort of zoom, on, uh, uh, zoom in onto those and uh, explain, explain what, what co covariance actually does. So this is what we are measuring in covariance. Right. We plot as a line the mean for adjectives here and the mean for nouns here. This is a value that we just calculate the usual, usual way. And then we are just interested in these distances. So every single point in the graph will have two distances. One from the first mean, the mean uh, based on the nouns, and the, the other one, the mean based on the adjectives. Right? So we get two values for each point when we just measure the distances, you know, even with a ruler, uh, ruler, ruler on, uh, on the graph. So. We'll do, we, we do this, and then we just uh, add those uh, di distances. We have these sort of two, two means, and then we just uh, uh, multiply these numbers and add them together to get our uh, measure of covariance. Right. Covariance is a, usually a fairly, fairly large number, depending on the on the data set, it is not a standardized number, so that's why we have to go one step further to uh, look at correlation, because we can't uh, compare and contrast covariance across different corpora and across, across different variables. So correlation is basically a standardized measure 
of covariance. How these two variables vary together, we take covariance and standardize it using two standard deviations, standard deviation for variable one and standard deviation for variable two. If we plug in the numbers from our uh, data set, the real data set you've just seen, I'll get something like 0.9. Right. 0.9 is a very high correlation value, and it is a positive correlation. Obviously, it has a plus sign, but we usually don't write the plus sign. We assume the plus sign uh, in front of the number. Right. So this is something that tells me that uh, there is uh, a very large effect, and ultimately, Pearson's correlation, and this is the measure of Pearson's correlation, are... Uh, is an effect size measure, and we can interpret it as such. So we can look at the size of the relationship between two variables. And there are some standard textbook guidance uh, uh, and rules for uh, actually the cutoff points, but again, you know, this is just recommended interpretation of these, uh, of these effect sizes. Uh, and, and they are R values in particular. So above 0.5 would be a uh, large effect, large correlation. We can also compute a p-value, and p-value will just tell us whether in the uh, data set we have enough evidence for this type of correlation. Right. In this case, the p-value is uh, small, smaller than point. Uh, uh, zero 0.5, smaller than 5%, so, uh, you know, we can be happy. We have a uh, large, significant correlation uh, with our uh, data set here. So, if the tendency is really, really clear, like the relationship between nouns and adjectives, it is enough to have just a few points to get uh, a strong, significant correlation statistic. Well, this is something to remember, and this is actually a very nice illustration of the relationship between effect size and significance, right? Because when we have correlation, we need to report both, right? And in most cases, in this other test, we also do report both the, the effect size and statistical significance. But with correlation, this is, this is a very, very nice and clear example. What this graph shows you is, on the x-axis, the number of observations. So this is, imagine this as the number of texts in your corpus, right, or number of speakers in your corpus, right, that you sample for your corpus. Uh, in the BEO6, I had 500, right, oh, with the original data club. Here's the effect size R, the correlation value, it, it, and it can range from zero to one, right? Zero being no correlation, no effect size, one being uh, a very strong correlation in absolute terms, right? It can be minus one if it is a negative correlation, but in absolute uh, terms, it is from zero to, 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 to one. So what this shows you is that if you have very few cases, very few speakers, you need a very strong correlation to reach significance. Right? However, on the other hand, if you have a thousand cases or more, you need just a tiny correlation, just a, you know, a tiny effect size that will be statistically significant. Right? This shows two things. One, that uh, significance and effect size are two separate dimensions. Right. Effect size tells us something interesting about what is going on in terms of the relationship. Right. Is it a strong relationship or is it just a sort of loose relationship in language? Whereas significance tells us just something about our corpus, how much data we have, and is it enough to reach a certain threshold right, of confidence. So uh, the flip side of that is that if people just look at significance, and are happy to publish when they look at significance and ignore the uh, effect size values, they will report negligible correlations, and they, they are all over the place, 
right, as something important. Well, importance and significance are very, very different, different things indeed. And this can be empirically demonstrated uh, on this graph. So, again, repeating that. So, just an illustration of what I was talking about, just to show you uh, that uh, focusing and relying on significance can be tricky in correlation, but in, in other uh, statistical measures as well. So here's my original graph, if you remember. This is the graph that I really had to search for because uh, there was no relationship between pronouns and coordinators in my B06 corpus. One million word, uh, words of uh, current British English, 500 texts here. Right. So I get a very small cor correlation and large p-value, over 50%, so yes. No significance, you know. I, I have no, no no evidence that there will be there will be a strong uh, uh, relationship between between these. However, what I've done now is just taken the same data set and copied the files several times. So instead of 500, I have 5,000 of them, but identical files. Right. So they show the identical pattern. So the <laughs> the graph looks the same because they overlap. Right. Just 10 times, every circle is 10 data points. That can be significant, <laughs> right? The small, the same small effect size, that doesn't change, right? The relationship doesn't change. What, what changes is the amount of evidence that we have. And now, you know, people would open the bottles of champagne and, and you know, celebrate, but it just means that you have a very large corpus. So this is something to bear in mind when we evaluate uh, the evidence that we are looking, looking, looking at. And that's why visualization is so important and common sense when we look at, look at the data. There's actually not much of a relationship here between the two. All right? It's just a tiny one, but we have, you know, we have some, what, what the significance tells us ultimately is that we have some tiny evidence that the relationship is not zero. But not zero doesn't mean anything interesting. Right? So, of course, 0 0.029 is not zero, but it's almost zero. And by all practical intents and purposes, it is zero. Okay. So, just to wrap up things with correlation, we have two types of correlation the Pearson's correlation, and we've talked about the Pearson's correlation, and all these examples were based on Pearson's correlation coefficient uh, that is abbreviated as R. But we have also a non-parametric version of correla correlation that is called the Spearman's correlation, RS or Rho, that's the Greek letter, so it's uh, spelled either like that or just one Greek letter. And the Spearman's correlation is usually used with ranks when we have ordinal data, right? When we rank data like ranks in a word list. If we want to compare them uh, with two corpora, we could use the Spearman's correlation. Sometimes people use Spearman's correlation if the data is not normally distributed or extremely skewed. They just uh, convert it into ranks and then uh, run the Spearman's correlation. Pearson's correlation uh, is a statistic that is computed for scale data, like relative frequencies, right? Something that we would use normally in corpus, corpus linguistics when we measure variables. We can also visualize correlations in many different ways. You've seen a scatter plot. If we have multiple relationships in the data, we can have multiple uh, scatter plots and a matrix like this one. Right? So you can see the relationship between nouns, adjectives, verbs, pronouns, and coordinators all in one graph. Right? The graph on the left. Right? It's always so a binary re relationship but between two, two variables. We can also use a plot that shows us whether the correlation is positive or negative using the color, right? 
the negative correlation would be red here and the positive cor correlation would be blue and the intensity of the color would be the strength of the relationship. Right? So we have different ways we can uh, visualize correlation and again this can be done in the Lancaster Stats tools online uh, as part of the co correlation procedure. You can visualize it and calculate it at the same time. Okay, moving on and thinking about clusters and cluster analysis. And I just would like to point out a few, few things because cluster analysis is really, really interesting. Imagine that uh, we have two variables and cluster analysis can be run with multiple variables. But just for the demonstration purposes, I, I will be considering two variables. One is frequency of words and another is word length in number of characters in a word. Right. And I was interested in color terms in English, right? color words in English, such as black and white. Right. These are fairly short. Red is the shortest one in terms of number, number of characters. Uh, but I was also interested in the frequency of their use in a corpus. Right. The correlation correlates the, f the, the frequencies of variables. What cluster analysis is trying to do is trying to group together these objects, such as you know, our linguistic variables. So we want to see whether they behave in a similar way based on the data that we have, whether we can group them or not. And already here, you can see that some of them are closer together in this graph than, than others, right? And if we want to do this in a principle statistical way, we would use the uh, cluster analysis, the hierarchical agglomerative cluster analysis. The term sounds horrible, but it actually is a very nice descriptive term because uh, we use sort of a hierarchical step-by-step -step process of agglomerating, so putting them together, right? Uh, so in practical terms, we would do something like that, right? The numbers shows, the, the number here shows the uh, priority in which they were grouped. So you first group those ones that are closest together, and then you move on and group them, then so next, next ones and next ones. So you start here, uh, white and black are close together, then you move on to pink and gray, right? Then you move on uh, to the next one, which is this group, right? Aquamarine, Quirqua, and Burgundy. And then you sort of create one large cluster. Ultimately, you end up with the whole thing being one, one large cluster. If you translate it into the usual uh, type of analysis, this is a hierarchical tree plot or, or a dendrogram, right? You will see that this sort of spatial grouping is translated into the grouping in this, in this tree. Right? So black and white are grouped first here, then these ones, and, and so on and so forth. Right? Ultimately, you end up with number nine. That's when you group everything together. You know, draw a circle around, around, around the whole thing. So you can actually see the distances here and the height of the graph shows you the distances between uh, between the individual points in the in the graph. So you can actually uh, start interpreting it. There are two things to remember about uh, the hierarchical agglomerative uh, cluster analysis, and actually two choices you have to make in the process. The first choice is to choose the measure of distance. And normally, in common usage, we have just distance when, that we sort of measure with a, you know, measure distance from A to B in one standard standard way. What is the distance between Lancaster and London? You know, you would you would look at Google Maps and there would be the, the distance. But in statistical terms, there are different notions of distance, and you have you have different different choices. Just to demonstrate that, I would like to mention Euclidean distance, the usual notion of distance that we usually have in everyday life, and uh, then Manhattan distance, which is why you have this, this blue here. Uh, 
the distance, Euclidean distance, you can see the, the equation, but don't worry about the equation. What is important uh, is this. The notion of Euclidean distance is the shortest distance or the shortest link between A to B, like that. Right. And if you want to calculate it, this is the equation. Right. You need the coordinates of point A and coordinates uh, of point B. Right. And you plug them in, so that's x and y in, in the equation. Manhattan distance, and again, don't worry about the equation unless you want to, is again, if we have two points between A and B, uh, and we can't go directly, right? The reason why this is called Manhattan distance is that you have to imagine a city like New York, for instance, right? And in New York, if you want to go from A to B, you can't go directly, right? You have to follow the streets and avenues, and you have to do something like that. Right? So it's not the uh, closest or sort of uh, the, the best way to go, go about but it has some very interesting mathematical properties. So sometimes the Manhattan distance is used uh, for cluster analysis. And there are different notions of distance in uh, statistics. These are just two, two, two examples and these are the two, two choices. Manhattan distance is a nice one and that is very often used in this cluster analysis. And then the second choice that we have is how do we merge the clusters? How do we link them based on what principle? Again, if you think about it, it's not trivial. It seems like, okay, I've created a new cluster, but you know, how do I link it to the rest of the data points? And there are four possibilities, four possible analyses, and four possible me methods of linking that are available if you look at a tool that does the cluster analysis. You can either uh, link the closest points to the neighboring cluster, right? the point inside your new cluster that is closest to the neighboring cluster. Or, alternatively, you can look at the point that is further away from, from, from the cluster. Or, you can look at the mutual distances of all data points and then take their mean value, sort of mean value, the, sort of the point that will be sort of sitting in the middle of the cluster and the middle of another cluster link those. Or there's this Watts method that is considering the sum of squared distances. Again, this is a bit of sort of mathematic wizardry. The Watts method is actually the most sophisticated one and very often used. Right? So if you want a default, I would go for Manhattan distance and number four options here. Right? But you can play with, with these because there are you know, some implications and the book actually shows you what the implications are for real language data when you compare the same data set using different uh, clustering techniques. Right. Okay. Finally, I would like to mention the multidimensional analysis, and uh, you are probably familiar with this uh, with this book uh, that uh, started this whole area of research, and now there's a journal. Uh, that uh, is published on multidimensional analysis and register variations journal using uh, primarily this type of technique. So uh, it's you know this this tiny book and it is a thin book and you know, really really nice read if you if you haven't haven't read it by Doug Biber uh, started this whole field of analysis within corpus linguistics. So what are we talking about? We are talking about the multiple relationships in language and multiple variables seen at once. And this is the complexity that we can actually deal with as part of this type of analysis. So think about all the word classes. Think of all the grammatical categories that there are, present tense, past tense, uh, perfect aspect, and, and so on. Think about different semantic categories types of verbs, uh, quotatives, types of prepositions, syntactic variables, right? deletion of that, for instance, or think about you know, all sorts of things, subordinates, clauses, and, and so on and so forth. 
if you think of the complexity of lexis and grammar all together, and if you sort of put this all into one analysis, this is actually what uh, the multivariate analysis can handle. Right, so let me take you through that step by step. And one of the great things is that you'll be able to perform multidimensional analysis in the, in the lab using data provided. And ultimately, you'll be able to use your own data because we have a tool that does this for you very, very easily. OK, this is, you don't have to read that. This is just to uh, show you that there are many variables, right? When the Bible started, he looked at 67 variables, the original 67 variables across different categories, right? These are sort of modals and uh, uh, probably different, different types of modals, different types of uh, grammatical categories, past tense, present tense, first person pronoun, and so, so on and so forth. And since then, people have added multiple categories. So sometimes the multidimensional analysis is performed with 100 plus categories. So this is a sort of open-ended type of list of variables that might be of interest. Right? The way Viber identified them was he searched the literature for variables that were reported to play or you know have have, have some kind of. Uh, uh, relationship or play a role in uh, register variation, right? How different registers, functional uses of language differ from each other. So newspapers from spoken language, from fiction and so on. Right? So he looked at what people reported, what features would be of interest and he compiled this very interesting list and people have added uh, many more, and people have done this not only for English, but for many other languages as well. Right. This is actually quite important because this is what your data set need, need, needs to look like. Right? When you have your Excel spreadsheet or Calc spreadsheet, uh, what you need to do for performing multidimensional analysis, and again, this is not the whole, the whole data set, right? it wouldn't fit, fit the screen, but it's just, uh, uh, just a sort of tiny tiny part of the, of the data set. What you have here in column A is a list of files in your corpus, and this goes on, right? Could be 500, 5,000, depending on how, how large your corpus is. Then you have to decide on the register. You need a register label. You need to classify the file beforehand to say, okay, this is uh, from news, or this is from fiction, or this is a spoken text. Right. So this is your column B. And then column C to as far as you want to go uh, are the relative frequencies of those linguistic variables per text. Right. Relative frequencies because the texts are of different sizes in corpora. So past tense, perfect aspect, present tense, place adverbials, time adverbials, first person pronoun. Right, you measure, measure the frequencies. If you have a good corpus tool, the good corpus tool can produce uh, those lists for you. Right? Planxbox, for instance, can produce those lists for you in the WELK tool. Right? So you would search for your grammatical structure or a word of interest or the pronoun of interest, and then the WELK tool would give you the list of uh, these frequencies very easily. You would just copy-paste it into Excel. So this is really, really uh, something that you can, you can do uh, very, very easily in one afternoon. Right. What you need to do is have enough of these. Right. I'm just showing a few that you would need to add. Viber had 67 columns here, right. but you can have as many as you like. OK. This is the core of factor analysis. It is a complex mathematical procedure that produces a large number of linguistic, or that reduces rather, a large uh, number of linguistic variables to a small number of factors. So it is a data reduction procedure, right? Each combining multiple linguistic variables. This is done by considering correlations between variables, and those that correlate both positively and negatively are considered components of the same factor because they have a connection, right? So we started with correlation. Correlation is part of this very complex procedure. 
And we do that on a very large scale, though, using an automatic procedure. Right? We see if, the, if two variables co correlate, they have much in common. Right? So we would sort of reduce those to a sort of meta variable that we call a factor. Right? And if we put multiple variables together, then we can actually reduce the huge number of variables and the huge amount of variation that is very hard to make sense of to something that is nice and neat and you can actually see the major tendencies in the data. So by reducing the variation and reducing the number of variables, we actually, some clear patterns emerge, and I'll show you what I mean by that. So here's an example of what we do uh, when we uh, create factors. Here are just uh, two factors, but you know, there can be multiple factors uh, extracted. And here are, and these are some real examples uh, uh, from, from British English data. So I have present tense, uh, contractions, these are the sort of contracted uh, forms like I can't, uh, I'm, as, a, as opposed to I am, second person pronouns, that deletion, and so on, past tense, third person pronouns, perfect aspects, uh, uh, and, and so on, you know, different types of verbs. Uh, what I can see when I plot them, and I plot their relative frequencies, uh, I can see that, you know, these sort of cluster together and these cluster together, right? So, uh, they appear in text uh, in a sort of similar way, and they sort of point probably to a similar type of linguistic reality. So what I can do is I can actually draw these two factors based on those variables. So instead of quoting every single variable, I can quote just these two factors. Right? There's a small technicality that you don't have to worry about because the computer can do that for you. But in order for the factors to match the data clearly, you have to rotate them a bit, right? To go th through the data set, right through the middle, right? So this is part of the process that is called the factor rotation, right? Again, a small technical detail which does exactly this in the background. The decision that you have to do or uh, take in the uh, factor analysis is uh, how many factors you want to look at and how many factors are meaningful to look at. These factors uh, should be a small number, right? Because if you have you know, a large number of factors, you can have as many factors as you have variables, then you wouldn't have achieved anything. Right? You started with 67 variables and you would have 67 factors and, you know, why bother, right? So we want to reduce the amount of variation. But there's a trade-off. The trade-off is that lo you lose some information in the data, right? So this is the trade-off that we are happy to accept. We lose some variation in the data, but reduce the large number of variables and focus on a few factors. To be able to do that, we are very often produce something that is called a scree plot. And again, the tool can do that for you automatically. The scree plot is a plot that has the number of factors here, and I have all 67 here, right up to 67, because I have 67 variables, and that's my theoretical possibility. And this is an eigenvalue. Eigenvalue shows me how much variation the factor is able to explain, right? The larger the eigenvalue, the more variation the factor can explain. So I can see that factor one has a very large eigenvalue. So I'm very happy about this factor because it combines lots of these variables and lots of these tendencies in one factor, right? So it does a you know, does great job here. Factor two is all right as well. Again, a fairly, fairly large eigenvalue, although relatively smaller than the eigenvalue in factor uh, one. Factor three, four, five are still probably okay, and there are sort of different decision uh, principles that I can use. Some people say if the eigenvalue is larger than one, then include the factor and that will be all right. Uh, uh, some people say, well, just look at the scree plot and where, well, where it starts of trailing off, 
you know, make, make the cutoff point there, right? Because uh, the scree plot is, you know, going on down uh, at sort of a sharp angle and then it trails off, right? So at the sort of point of inflection, as we sometimes call it, this is the point of inflection, right? Where uh, it sort of starts leveling, leveling off. You would say, okay, that's enough. I'm happy with my factor, fa factor numbers. Uh, Biber originally extracted uh, some six or seven, seven factors. The m most meaningful are the first three or four, right? As you can see, because they have something very interesting to say about language variation, and then the other factors are more difficult to interpret if you include them, right? So you have to sort of really sort of stick with uh, a small, small number of factors. Then you get the factors, and then you have to interpret them in some way. You interpret the factors as dimensions. So factors is a term from statistics, from uh, factor analysis. Dimension is a term from linguistic interpretation. It is the same thing, but one step further. Right? When you start looking at factors and start interpreting them, they become dimensions in Viber, Viber's terminology. You interpret them by looking at which variables are associated with the factors, both, both positively and negatively. The variables, and I'm looking at factor one here, that are positively associated or correlated, if you like, with uh, uh, factor one or dimension one now are these, but also there are variables that are negatively associated with the factor. This means that if I have a text that has many of these features in high frequencies, it will have very few of those, right? So there's a competition. Think of the dimension as a competition, right? Between a group of features here and a group of features uh, down there, right? The group, group C that are somewhere in the middle with no strong correlations with the factor, we can just disregard because they are not relevant, right? So what, what is relevant is group A and group B, either strongly positively correlated with the factor or strongly negatively correlated with the factor, right? Because then we can interpret it in some way. The way Biber does that is provides labels for these extremes, right? Like involved and informational, right? He looks at these features and tries to think about their function in language and discourse, right? We can, for instance, see that contractions, lot of personal pronouns, that deletions, you know, I think this is great rather than I think that, that this is great. Uh, sort of signal in formal language, you know, very colloquial style of language, contractions as well, right? In traditional written language, we would have uh, he was not there rather than he wasn't there. Uh, so, again, these are all pointers to something that he thinks uh, uh, or Bible labels as involved or socially involved. When people are socially involved at this informal level, uh, they use lots of, lots of these. You can, you know, create these labels, uh, come up with them at your own, you know, discretion. So there's, you know, not, 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 nothing specific about that. I'm just using Bible's terminology here. Uh, you can say social, if you like, or you know, what, whatever label you, you can think of. Nominalizations, uh, so many nouns and, and, and these sort of nouns uh, uh, ending in itty, uh, like productivity, uh, uh, or you know, these sort of formal nouns, adjectives, passives, many prepositional phrases and many nouns in general. Well, obviously this is something that is very much associated with descriptive academic writing, formal documents, right, full of information. So that's why we have the informational label here, right? So this is the interpretation that a linguist provides. This is not what statistics does for you. Ultimately, what you do is you have your dimension that you have interpreted, and then you place back the registers that you started with onto the dimension. So you have your involved informational, and I'm just zooming in onto the large scale because you wouldn't be able to see that. So uh, at the inform or rather involved uh, uh, poll, you can see telephone conversations and face-to-face -face conversations. Yes, indeed. These texts have the largest number of contractions 
largest number of pronouns and so on. Then you move down and you have personal letter. Uh, personal letter here and interviews and, and spontaneous speech. They are still high on involved, right? Because they are still sort of very, very informal. Moving down, biographies, reviews, academic prose, and official documents have a minus, right? So they are high on the informational score. So when you sort of move down the scale, you can see different types of registers clustering, clustering there on the scale from involved to informational. You can do it with as many factors as you like and come up with the labels of the, of the other factors as well. We'll do it in practice. It's probably sort of take some time to process because the, you know, there are multiple steps involved in this analysis. But you know, once you've done that yourself, you'll be able to, to, to do, you do that for any, any type of data set. So we'll have some training, training data in the computer, computer lab. So just to wrap things up, things to remember from this lecture. So correlations are used to investigate the relationship between two variables at a time. Right? If I have two variables, I might like to look at correlation if I'm interested in the relationship. And we have several options. The Pearson's correlation is suitable for scale variables, while Spearman's correlation assumes ordinal variables, so ranks in, in the data. And we talk about the difference between scale and ordinal. Spearman's correlation can also be computed uh, with scale variables, but uh, this is at the cost of you know, losing some of the data. This would be done if we have extremely skewed distributions and we wouldn't be comfortable with the Pearson's correlation for that. So we are happy to lose some of the data uh, or some of the information in the data and uh, get still some uh, general tendencies, whether there's a correlation or not. We talked about the clustering algorithm and the hierarchical agglomerative cluster analysis that is used to classify words, text, and registers, if, 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 if you like. So it can classify any objects based on their properties, their linguistic properties. Right? The result is a dendrogram, so a tree plot that you need to interpret. And you know how to interpret it using the distance uh, idea, and we have different types of distance. And obviously, the most complex type of analysis of uh, these all is the multidimensional analysis, uh, the type of analysis that uh, is used if you have a large number of linguistic variables and you want to look at all of them together, right? Because correlation just allows you to look at two at a time, whereas the multidimensional analysis allows you to put them all together and actually reduce the variation into a small number of factors that you then interpret as different dimensions and then you place the individual registers onto those dimensions. So a piece of cake, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much. <laughs>